It's Wednesday, June 6th. I'm Scott. I'm Rim. And this is The Geek Nights. Tonight, we review the amazing, awesome comic just released in trade paperback, Elk's Run. You know, if it weren't for the fact that the one thing I need from Linux isn't on Windows, I think I would have given up on Linux pretty much right now, at least for my primary computer, because audio just doesn't work for shit in Linux. I got I to gotta say, I got to admit. Well, I mean, it's not that audio doesn't work in Linux. It, audio is shitty in Linux, there is no doubt. It's just that Linux works pretty much perfectly well for absolutely normal, everyday computers. Yeah, apparently tasks. it's not normal to record. Yeah, and it works perfectly normal on nor you know run of the mill older hardware. When you have a new fancy computer, it's not going to work for shit at Except all. Except it's not that new. I without mean, a great deal of effort, it's not really that new and fancy. This chipset's relatively old. And see, but it's it's relatively new and fancy compared to Linux. I'm talking like you know two year old stuff here. Well, and I if think you've the, got some sixty four bits or two cores or. I think the problem is more that most people who use Linux don't do anything like podcasting so no one really cares about if the audio actually works for anything intense well see that's the thing is that there are a lot of podcasters on linux who there's like three there's actually a whole like at least 20 or 30 i can name like five i think all right but it's you know it it's mostly the fact that if you want linux to be easy you pretty much ubuntu feisty is the way to go And that's also the best way to get the newest hardware working with the least effort. But also, because of the way Ubuntu works, you're not going to be able to upgrade the kernel. Like, there's a better kernel that might work really well on your computer, but you can't get that in Feisty really easily. You know, Gentoo you could, but that's a huge pain in the ass. So it all comes down to, like, your distributions and all this stuff. And right now, there does not exist a Linux distribution that... Without a great deal of effort, it doesn't have problems doing exactly what we want to do. It's always the special cases that it totally fucks on. In all the general cases, Linux has it covered. When it comes down to a special case, like I want to do this specific thing that is slightly out of line of the norm, you're going to run into at least one bump in the road. It's guaranteed. Yeah, like, I want to play games on my computer. Oh, Linux can't do that. Well, it can. (laughs) No, it can't. It's because the games haven't been written for Linux. Oh, I know, but the fact remains. It plays Doom 3 just fine. Oh, great. Yeah. Doom 3 was such a wonderful game. See, at least the audio is actually a complaint, like there's something wrong with Linux. The game's complaint is not really anything wrong with Linux. It's In fact, I say it's a miracle that you can whine so many games. (laughs) Yeah, but there's more games you can't whine. Ah, uh, that is true. Honestly, I would just boot into Windows, but Resound doesn't work. In, Resound barely works in Linux, so it certainly doesn't work in Windows. Yeah, yeah. It just. I think more of our problem also is that there just don't exist that many quality single track wave editing programs. There just aren't any of them. They, 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 where are they? There's Resound, which has a bunch of problems. There was Cool Edit. There 2000. was Cool Edit. And I guess audition, and that's... What else is there? There's that Sony thing. Fuck that. What, there's a whole freaking type of application, and there are so few choices, and no one's working on this problem. Because no one cares except me, and that's I don't like, have time to I know, work but on like, it. Imagine what am if I there was do? like only one spreadsheet. You know what? There effectively is, because most people don't know about OpenOffice, and they don't care. But I'm saying is, like, there are a whole bunch of spreadsheets, and they all work. And if you need one, you can get one. Yeah. And it's not a problem. We need a specific application. It doesn't exist. Because not many people do what we do. I think it's a lot of people do would do that. It's just they don't know any better. Well, no, I mean, they, I, like I said, they don't do what we do. They do things differently. They do things stupid. They use that GarageBand or all those other programs, the way the multi-track editors work. Like, Audacity is a pretty good multi-track editor, but it's actually really crap if you want to edit or actually filter audio. All the filters are garbage. The compressor is garbage. The LADSPA support barely works. And most of the LADSPA plugins are crap, but that's, it's Wednesday, so we don't need to talk about this anymore. I'm just miffed that my new computer is awesome, except for podcasting. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, well, what you gonna do? So... Uh, I got some news, but the site that has the news article currently has an internal server error. But that doesn't matter because I remember the news enough. Basically, it's bad news. Really bad news. Like, possibly some of the worst news. 
if you've ever seen, I don't know, Macross, you know, the original one, the amazing, amazing TV show that is the amazing of all amazingness, or if you've seen, uh, I don't know, a whole bunch of other anime that I can't really remember the names of at all because I probably haven't watched any of them, but it doesn't matter. You li- watch Macross, it has this amazing soundtrack. It's like fully composed with an orchestra and the whole deal, and it's it's really sort of weird, but it fits so well, and it's so wonderful in every way. And it was composed by a man named Kentaro Haneda. And Kentaro Haneda, I regret, has recently passed away. Now, if I had it available, which I don't just because I haven't migrated all of my data yet, I would probably have played the Macross National Anthem just now. I've got every Macross MP3 there is on my uh, computer over there. So, if we want, we can go get it. No, not with all the problems I'm having with audio right now in Linux. Yeah, yeah. But regardless... This is kind of sad, because he was this amazing composer, and if you've never watched Macross, you should at least, like, watch some episodes and just listen to the music in that show, even if you don't like the show, because it's not a show for everyone, even though it's a show for everyone. What's wrong with you not liking it? I'll admit, I it's okay. I don't, I don't like it that much. You suck. And I've watched almost all of it. You suck. But uh, the music in it is really something to behold, and... They're going to have a big concert. They were planning this already, having a big concert for, uh, you know, the, I guess, 25th anniversary of Macross, I think. I'm not sure. But uh, when they had, they're going to, of course, now dedicate that concert to this guy. So I'm definitely going to, like, be looking for a DVD of that or something. Let's go to the concert. I think it's a little far away. Where is it? Japan? Other side of the world. Let's head over there. That's all you. No biggie. Yeah. Right. So in news more close to home, uh, con season is upon us. This is more of a personal news. It's not a news that's out there on the internet anywhere. It's just my observations. We're making news. Oh my god, is that the wow. next, is that the next step for Geek Nights to make news? We're gonna be as journalists. Just read news from a website. Well, uh, it's kind of annoying news, and I haven't really. I have one or two last ditch leads I could use to figure out what's going on, but I gotta say that I'm getting the impression that Otakon is really not. That together this year compared to any other year of Otakon. And it's really, it's more upsetting because I'm looking at what other cons are doing. Look at the, go to Anime Expo's website and look at the news. Remember we talked about Anime Expo, was it last week or two weeks ago? Yep. They're doing some crazy, amazing shit over there. Like, I usually, like, I've never been to Anime Expo, so, but I had suspicions about it for a long time that it was a very industry-centric con, and I got the feeling that it wasn't my kind of deal. But based on the news and the press releases they have put out this year, it's looking really hot, just in terms of what they're having there, you know, regardless of anything else I may be suspicious about. Meanwhile, Otakon is, what, a month or two away, and they haven't announced a musical guest or, or, or anything, and they just recently had, like, the panels and the Artist Alley submissions, and they haven't gotten back to anybody about well, it i don't know if they've gotten back to anyone or not for the artist alley but they definitely did not respond in any way to my request for a table at all i mean usually cons get all this stuff out of the way way before the con like you'll get your artist alley table like six months in advance you'll get your pet pa- you'll know know what if you're doing a panel or not way in advance i mean how are people who are like preparing fancy panels Supposed to know, like, prepare the panel in such a short period of well, time. I'll, I'll put it in very specific because it's not just my perception. I'll tell you exactly about my interactions with all the conventions we've been working with this year and for next year. All right. And basically, m- long time ago when I started talking to Kineticon, we've already hammered the whole thing out. Kineticon is already set and we're done. We've already got all of our programming ready. All, all right, that's so left Kinetic- to do Kin- is to specifically schedule when they'll all be. But I already have a vague idea. Yep, so Kineticon is like a couple weeks before Otakon. You got this hammered out when? Oh, God, over a month ago. In over fact, a month ago. In fact, they responded to me within 12 hours every single time I've emailed them. And in fact, they out of the blue send me status updates on what's going on. All right. And didn't we just hear something from Katsukan? Oh, all right. So Katsukan next year. Uh, well, one, we're subscribed to the sta- like the video game Katsu staff email list because we're kind of staff for them, and it was really fun. We're, last we're year. half members of Game Katsu. Yeah, yeah, and those guys are all awesome. Yeah. But basically, unlike I don't know how other conventions work, but I do know that watching that mailing list, they started planning next Katsukan pretty much 
two weeks after Katsukan ended, and they've been continuously talking about it, and now they're already putting together the programming for Katsukan. We're already working with them to get the programming done for Katsukan. Which is months and months and months away, a long time from now. Meanwhile, Otakon, perhaps our favorite con. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to name any names, because I don't know how many of you work with these people, but... I've emailed Otakon. I've sent dozens of emails to Otakon and various people in the past several years. Maybe and that's oh, in the several years. Okay. Yeah, but this I was like, year, maybe that's why they're not replying because you're emailing no, them to death. But this year, I anyone I've ever emailed within Otakon has not responded to me at all. Or if they did, they responded with basically nothing. Or they said, in fact, at one point I got an email saying, "Oh well, we'll get back with you shortly. We're almost done with whatever," and then they just never follow up. It's like. Okay, your con is the biggest and the baddest on the East Coast, but if you don't get on the ball, I think it, it's already on its way. It feels like it's it's on the way down now. Like I honestly, all the, the other cons have bigger, badder events, and they're on the ball. And Otakon. Is, I mean, I hate to say it, but we're getting to the point where if they don't respond soon, even if they want us to do panels, we're not gonna prepare anything. We're not. We can't. We've got too much else to do with other cons now. I know. It's it's it's. I might like. And if they drop the ball too hard this year, I, I could see in the future, like, it, it could be the doom of Otakon in a few years, or it, it could be at least, we might not even go. Yeah, meanwhile, uh, the New York Anime Festival, which a lot of people have maligned a little bit about being very corporate yep, and for I was very skeptical about the New York Anime Festival, to say because it was run by the same people as New York Comic Con, and it's going to be for profit, it's going to be the Javits Center. And those three things, when added to anime convention... Send off all the alarm bells in the brain of Scott saying, warning, warning, major catastrophe coming to you soon. Well, we can't talk about it yet. Well, I don't know if we can, but I, I don't want to reveal anything well, about it. Well, let me go con. see what they've said on their website. Yeah, suffice to say, they, it seems like they've got their act together really well and a lot better than anyone would have expected. And I actually have high hopes for this convention now. Plus, when I talk, talk to them about panels, we already, the contract's done. We're doing panels there. It's already all set up. And this thing isn't until December. Yeah, December, people. We actually have time to prepare things. Yeah, I you actually... Know, it's, it's, I, I, don't want, I don't know, because see, I don't have access to the internal Otakon communications because it's a much more, I guess, closed information con compared to other cons. So I could just be, you know, making up stuff or it could be totally wrong. But my this is my perception I'm talking here and I don't speak for the truth of anything. But... From going on Otakon message boards and proposing many suggestions for the con over the years, many times suggestions that were, I think, quite good suggestions, not all the time, but sometimes, were always shot down as saying that will require too much, effort, you know, physical, manual labor. We don't have the people or the time or the manpower. And I accepted that answer, you know, as, oh, okay, you can't possibly do this unless you have a whole bunch of money to hire people to do it because it takes forever and whatever. But I really, I get the feeling, personally, that the people who run Otakon, at least some of them, or someone who's doing something, is not working as hard or as many hours for the con outside of the actual hours of the con compared to other conventions. That's now, the feeling that I get. Granted, I mean, one, don't forget, Otakon is still our favorite con. It, it, uh, it might not be, but right now it still is, yeah. as of cons I've been to. And two, I mean, it's like all these cons, they're all volunteer work, so... Well, you yep. can't fault someone for not putting in, I don't know, the, like the super effort that we would put into something like that. Yep. At the same time, uh, I have offered every year for the past three years to just handle panels for Oticon and join the staff. And no one is at once. Someone said, yeah, we'll get back with you. And they never got back with me. And then in person at the con, someone said, yeah, we'll email you. And they never emailed me. And I just gave up. And I got to say, of all the cons that we've ever done panels with, even in previous years, Otakon really doesn't respond. Well, these panels at Otakon has never responded to emails in a timely manner. And it's really hard to work with them to get a panel going. These people, they need to remember if you're, I mean, if I emailed, I don't know, if I picked a random convention, like uh, Akon, I guess. That's, I know that's a convention called Akon, right? If I emailed them today, I would imagine that they would email me back tomorrow or within the week at least. That would be like, and that would be actually well, kind of bad. In the very least, if it was to a specific department. I mean, if you just send an email to the con chair of Otakon, oh, no, I right. don't expect the con chair of Otakon no, no, no. to respond to but me. But like if I had a specific thing, like, you know, asking for some information or something that wasn't on their website, I'm pretty sure they'd get back to me. Otakon just doesn't get back to people, and that's a big problem. I mean, and uh, 
I, I just want the not to again not to name any names, but there's a couple other people who are staff or should be staff for Oticon who have expressed to me independently that they have had a lot of hard time getting answers out of anyone else in the Oticon staff. And even like the big panels that we do every year, no one knows what's going on with them. And I'm at the point where I'm assuming that I'm not doing anything at Oticon this year. Yeah, I, I guess all I can say left is uh, we need to work on our communication. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just bothers me because Oticon's my favorite con. And yeah, I want it. I, I guess <laughs> I feel like I, I mean, I'm not, I want to put my money where my mouth is because we kind of, we panned Kineticon a little bit last year and Kineticon immediately got back with us and said, all right, hot shots. Well, uh, if that's how you feel, then are you going to help out? And we said, damn straight. Yep. That's exactly right. And so now like, you know, Kineticon respect plus plus, you know, you might, my experience going to your convention as a guest last year might not have. You know, I, I meant everything I said in whatever podcast we reviewed it. But now you come up and you're like, all right, you know, we're actually cool people. We, you know, we didn't, we can't do everything. Not everyone's perfect. Not every convention is going to be perfect. And it's not going to be perfect for everyone. But, you know, you, you're talking shit. All right, come on. And so respect for them. But Otakon, you know, they put on this great convention that I enjoy a lot every year. But trying to interact with them, not making yeah. me happy. I mean, I just think I'll end it on this. And I don't think this is an egotistical thing to say, but I think that despite doing Geek Nights and my job and all the other things in my life, I could probably handle the panels part of Oticon and respond to every email I got within 24 hours. And I'd probably have all the panels set and done at least five months before the convention. In fact, I would require them to be well, done. Well, at least all the fan panels, because I know it's hard. you got to coordinate with the industry people Yeah, and all I wouldn't that, have but... the schedule of what time and what rooms, but I would know... You know, exactly how many hours worth of panel uh, programming I needed. And uh, I would have the people and their and what panels they were doing lined up well in advance. And I would not allow that to change unless, you know, someone quit on me. And I'd have backups, too. I'd have, like, okay, prepare your panel, but I can't guarantee it'll go on just in case someone else quits. Yeah, well, I have a lot. I, I know exactly how we would run panels for Oticon or any convention. And uh, if Oticon would let us, we'd do it. But until then... We'll see what happens at Oticon, because I don't know what we're doing at Wouldn't this Wouldn't that point. be hilarious if we went to Oticon there was no panels? Nah. That would be just, I don't know. You know what? I hate to say this, and this is really mean to say, but it'd be a lot like the previous Oticon. Oh. Because, I mean, not I'm not saying that every panel, at, well, every fan panel at Oticon last year was bad, but every one I attended was really, really terrible. Like, Below what I would expect from even a mediocre panel at a con like this. Oticon's too big to accept the bad yeah. panels. There might have been good ones that we, you know, didn't attend. I guess that's possible. Oh, there were a few. I, I forget the names offhand, but our listeners did tell us about the one or two panels yes. that were good. Yes, but if your convention is so big as Oticon, the biggest anime convention on the East Coast, you should have so many panel applications from so many people that you should be able to sift the wheat from the chaff. And there's not that much... Hour, there's not that many hours of panels to actually fill in. It should be trivial to fill them in with the highest quality panels so that any panel room at any time is awesome. It just might not, you know, fit someone's taste. I mean, I might not want to go to a Super Dolphy, Super Dolphy panel. But yeah, but you, can, you find... can have the best damn Super Dolphy panel in the country right there, guaranteed. Yeah. So yeah, whatever. Email us, Otakon. What yes. the hell's your problem? <laughs> Email new invention. Use it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, it's, I don't want to... You get one, you click the reply button. You get one, you click the reply button every time. In the very least, what I what you do, if you, if you can't respond to the email... Like, if I ask you, like, hey, who's going to be the musical guest, right? You don't just... You don't tell me because you can't tell me yet. Well, it depends on who you, you ask. If I was the con chair, I would ignore an email like that. I know, I know. But, like, if it was, like, a well-written professional email, right? Not just, like, hey, some punk kid going, who's the musical guest? OMG, right? But if a professional email comes in... You don't just ignore it, even if it's asking for something you don't know or you can't tell. You say, I regret to inform you, blah, blah, blah. At this time, I cannot reveal that information, blah, blah, blah. That way, at least we know fucking someone read it. That's all we want to know is that someone's <laughs> reading it, someone's paying attention, someone is doing something. You know, I want to feel like my email didn't just go into the void. How do I know a spam filter didn't eat it? That, that's all we need. I mean, I guess I put up with this for the last many years because I never really, I didn't work with many other conventions until now. And now that I've worked with a lot of other conventions, I'm starting to see that 
every other convention is really easy to work with. Yeah. They just like, hey, how you doing? You want a panel? I mean, God, Toricon scheduled a panel for us without even asking us. Yeah, that was the easiest to work with ever. Yeah. All right. All right, I think we're done with that. Yep. No malice was meant, of course, but... Uh, we're, it is. It, we're just state our personal experience. Yeah, yeah. Geek Nights, full of truthiness. Great. But that aside, it's time for Things of the Day. Total cop-out, but the fact that it was on Dig is kind of lucky, because this is one moment in The Simpsons that for some reason is oft-quoted and very often just brought up in casual conversation in the front row crew. This exact scene just happened to be on Dig today, so it's got to be my thing of the day. I don't know if I even want to explain what it is other than must crush capitalism. capitalism. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Basically, whenever communism comes up in our group, someone inevitably says, must crush capitalism. Or possibly, yes, that's what we wanted you to think. <laughs> yep. And here is where that came from. So now you are part of the inside joke as well. And you can lift 10 inside jokes. <laughs> so my thing of the day, Rim doesn't know about this. At least I'm pretty sure he doesn't know about this. Uh, I don't know. You didn't but show me. But I think me. you'll be very interested in it. It is a recipe. And it is a... It's not an Asian recipe, so the only way I could, but I can relate it to uh, Anime Day very loosely because uh, it is involving a rice cooker. Uh huh. Here is a recipe on how to make something in a rice cooker. You know what? He's gonna. You know what this recipe tells you how to make in a uh, rice cooker. All right, uh, let's see. I'll uh, give you a hint. It's not rice. All right, uh, I'm gonna take make a few guesses. Uh, sponge cake. Nope. Um, stew. Nope. Chili. Nope. Uh, flan. Nope. Jello. Nope. All right, I'm out. Bread. Just bread. Bread, you say? Here's a way to make bread in a rice cooker. You don't have a bread maker. You're afraid to use the oven. You want to use a nice, safe rice cooker. Follow these easy steps at this, you know, it's a, it's actually a recipe wiki place. The wiki how, the how-to manual you, you can know edit. what? We've got two rice cookers. We should take the old rice cooker and try to make bread in it because it yeah. certainly doesn't make but rice. But this guy made like this nice sort of circular loaf of bread in his rice cooker. It's Was it looking... the size and shape of the inside of a rice cooker? Yeah, but it's not. it doesn't go up to the full height of the rice cooker. Ah. Like it's only like a couple inches high and it's circular. Like here, look, it looks sort of like a uh, like a cheese disc. Huh. Only you, you cut out a wedge of it and eat it. Whenever we have a free weekend, which will be August at this point, uh, I might try that. Yep. Flour, yeast, sugar, salt, butter, milk, water, rice cooker. <laughs> so this is pretty cool for anyone out there with rice cooking. So we've done a lot of anime and everything lately. And every now, every time, it's like every day that goes by where we don't talk about comics. The comic fans who listen to us email us bit by bit asking us when we're going to talk about comics again. So I think today's that day. Actually, this comic we're going to talk about is is kind of funny because I get lots of comics. I mean, today, how many comics came in the mail? Oh, my God. <laughs> I came home and there was a box that was somewhat difficult to lift in the front porch. <laughs> yeah, basically, I pre-order comics two months in advance to get a huge discount. Like, I get 75% off some things. And I get mostly trades. So, like, I'll get, like, a $20 comic, like, trade paperback for, like, $12. So pre-ordering two months in advance is totally worth it. Plus, yep. I'm planning to sell everything I'm never going to read again, mostly to shave, save shelf space and save money again. Because I do end up pre-ordering. I don't get to see what I'm buying before I buy it, and sometimes I buy a bad comic. Most of the times I don't, but Yeah, sometimes I do. I mostly use it through Scott to get all of a given manga series that I really like. Yeah, manga. I pre-order manga two months in advance. $10 manga for me is like $7 yeah. and change. That's how I got Cromarty. That's how I plan to get Emma. Yep. So, it's one comic I ordered because I had a whole bunch of hype. And I read it, and it was pretty good. So, I usually, if I think a comic is pretty good and not underwear pervert, which means Rim will read it, then I'll, like, give it to him. Say, hey, read this sometime. We'll do it on the show. Yeah, basically, Scott comes into my room, at, you know, while we're doing the show. And then afterward, he'll usually just plop a comic book on my desk or something. Or just leave it in my room. And usually, Rim doesn't read it. Or he takes forever, and he doesn't read the whole well, see, thing. see, it used to be that way because I didn't train to commute. So I really had no time to read manga. Yeah. But now that I take the train, I grab a manga or a comic pretty much every day. So... This was kind of amazing because I gave it to Rim, and like a day later, he had read the whole thing. I was kind of surprised, too. I mean, usually I pick him up, flip him through him, and then say, all right, 
I'll get to this. I'll put it at the end of the queue. (laughs) (laughs) Which means it's never getting read. Yeah, my queue basically, my queue, not just my Netflix queue, but my life queue has a few things in the front and a few things at the back. And I just keep adding things to the middle, but I never get to the middle because the middle keeps growing. Yep. But no, I, for some reason, read it. Partly because it's, it was one shot. I knew that it would end and there wouldn't be more volumes of it. So if I liked it, I wouldn't be sucked into this trap of having to read it all like I was with Ex Machina. Uh, Ex Machina is going to end, though, I think after like 50 issues. So there's only like a few more trades before it's over. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that's fine. But even so, this I knew there's no commitment. I could pick nope. it up, put it down. And also, I'll admit, the art was kind of bad. So I didn't have my usual problem where I tend to read some comics and some manga, but not all manga and all comics really slowly and generally the better the art is the slower i read it because i spend a lot of time admiring the art yeah generally what i do is like i will admire art also when reading comics but like i don't admire the art in every panel like i'll admire just like the amazing panels like if i read akira like there's certain panels like i know where they are because i've read the whole thing like seven times and every time i get to them i'll stop and look at them for like a minute but then, as soon as I finish admiring it, I'm like burning through the panels and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages. But I will go back and admire the art when I'm not reading it. Like, I'll admire the art separately. Like, I'll just open the book. Oh, and I do that with it. Sanctuary all the time. I'll just walk over there, open a random Sanctuary, and flip to one of those two-page spreads. Yeah, yeah. Or Death Note, I do that sometimes. Yep, and yep. Actually, like, a lot of the... Uh, like, I have some DC books where actually I don't like them, but there's this really nice art in them, and I'll just look at them. But yeah, this book, the art, you know, it's not bad art. Like, oh, it doesn't detract. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't detract at all from the story. It's we didn't just, even say what the book is yet, and we're already... Oh, we're doing a Dave and Joel here. I know. Did we talk about it yet? Or no. Did we say what it was? I think, I think we did. I think it's time to do it now. All right. This book is called Elk's Run. It is by Joshua Hale Fialkov, and he, I think he's the writer. You know, the, I'll just say I had this horrible urge to, in uh, in the end, after we're done with the show, put the Kill Bill sound effect over you saying the name of it. Yep. And the art is by Noel Toison, and I'm pronouncing these names wrong, probably. And colors by Scott Keating, lettered by Jason Hanley, chapter title art by Datsun Tran, edited by Jason Rodriguez. Did you say Dr. Tran? No, but that was close. It was Datsun Tran. Datsun is a good name. Yeah. Anyway... It is published by Villard Books, which is actually, I looked up Villard Books. It's, uh, Villard Books is basically Random House. That's what it is. Oh. Yeah. It's just a a thing they're putting on, like, a lot of, uh, like, they're they're actually buying up a lot of cool, hip graphic novels like this and publishing them, which is pretty awesome. Right. So, it's a story, basically, about... An insular community that is created by, what, Vietnam War veterans? I think they're war veterans of some sort. It doesn't really matter. Basically, it's the Michigan militia. It's that idea. The people who, the super survivalists, the people who say this country is corrupt or going down the tubes or dangerous or whatever. We're true patriots, so we're going to live in the mountains in our own closed community, entirely self-reliant, with the real constitution and when the commies eventually come, we'll be the ones to hold out or, you know, that sort of thing. The not really a cult so much as just a very, very, uh, introverted, introspective, closed off community Yep. by choice and not by, uh, any other reason. Yep. So you have this, this group of people, maybe some hundred people or so, maybe a few hundred. It's hard to tell. And they decide to set up a town in Elk's Ridge in the middle of fuck nowhere, where no one... Wasn't it Elk's Run? No, I think Elk... I think it's Elk's Ridge. The town of Elk's Ridge in West Virginia. All right. Elk's Run is the name of the book. Ah. Yes. And it's basically impossible to get in or out of the town except through this tunnel. So... And the town sort of takes care of itself, except there's a guy who drives into the town with a truck full of supplies every week or so. Yep, and he even does that under the table in cash, so there's no record in the government anywhere that this town exists. Yep. And And these people live in seclusion, very happily, on their own, with their crazy ways. They're not really that crazy in their ways, at least as far as you can tell at the beginning of the book. Yeah, it definitely starts in this really kind of idyllic, yeah, this is kind of working. Yeah, and... You know, it's mostly the story starts to focus on the kids who live in this town. See, now think of this. These people decide that they want this community. All right. They bring their wives. All right. 
The wives are now in on it. But no one's allowed to leave. Like, that's one of the big rules they have is that no one co- no one goes out, no one comes in. It's completely cut off. They don't want any contact with the outside world because it'll corrupt the kids or whatever. But even so, it's still a choice. Now you've got kids being born here who realize that there's an outside world and realize that something weird is kind of like this is kind of a weird place to be living. But yet, what are they going to do about it? They're kids. Yeah, mostly, you know, you've got the the way they make it really frustrating is that, like, the main character is this teenage boy, and there's no girls in town. Like, there's one girl in town, maybe, and she's, like, way older than he is, like, to where out in, like, normal world, they wouldn't even, like, consider each other. But because they're the only, she's the only girl, it's sort of like, hey... And that, 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 talk about frustrating, you know, being forced to live in a closed community. There are no girls here. There, there just aren't any. It's not that you can't get one. You're some nerd. It's, there aren't any. And you can't leave to go find some, and none will come in. Now, I don't want to ruin any, because it's a one shot, you know, one story. I don't yes, want to ruin ba- any think, of the story in this. Yeah, I think it was originally eight comic book issues, and this trade paperback for nineteen ninety five manufacturer's suggested retail price is all eight of those issues in a row with a little bit of fun stuff at the beginning, like a little introduction page and a little, uh, is there a prologue page in the back? There's an afterword in the back. Basically, the story, without revealing much, is that, I mean, the community is kind of weird, and there is tension, I mean, despite the fact that it seems very ideal and very happy, there is tension among many of the people in this community. But it's all kind of below the surface. And a small thing happens. And this small thing sets into motion a chain of events that basically inexorably drives the town toward getting into this out-of-control situation where everything starts to break down and all the things that were under the surface start exploding out. And it's just an escalation from beginning to end. The, The pace of the book is such that everything is constantly, at every moment, getting more and more intense, more and more out of control, more and more difficult to deal with. Yeah, it definitely, uh, it feels pretty awesome just to read it because, you you know, you keep turning the pages at the same rate and things are just getting exponentially worse and crazier and worse and crazier and worse. And it it's, it's sort of like you're on this ride and you can't stop it. It's kind of like, really, this is really off the wall, but it's kind of like watching the movie Strange Days because Strange Days starts out very slow, kind of a mystery, detectives, police, whatever. And the, ex- the pace of the story just accelerates and accelerates and accelerates, and the plot just gets more and more and more out of control until you g- if you get to the end of the movie, you, you kind of lose track of just how far you've come. Yeah. And the book's the same way. By the end of this, you're in a place that you never would have expected this book to go. I've never seen Strange Days. I don't even know what it is. But I really? think the pace is also similar to that of uh, Falling Down. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is a lot like Falling Down, only without... well. You know what? The guy in Falling Down is a little bit like the dad in Elk's Run. Uh, actually, <laughs> just the thing a tiny is, bit. the dad in Elk's Run, obviously, I do not like. No. The guy in Falling Down, you can kind of go along with, like, where he's coming from. The dad in Elk's Run is just, wow, you're bad. Well, I think the main difference is at the end of Falling Down, the guy realizes when he says, I'm the bad guy. And in this, the dad basically says, uh, I'm still right. I'm still right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically. I hope we're not spoiling too much. I don't think we really are. Uh, I don't think, because I think even if we told you everything that happened, <sighs> and we're not going to say specifically things that happened, so you won't be really spoiled, but even if we told you, the point of reading this, I think, is is the ride along the way, and not so much, figure. it's not like a figuring it out. Yeah, because you know? the one thing that really draws me to it's this. It's like being on a roller coaster. It's not a mystery that you're going to get to the bottom of the hill, scream a lot, and then go up the next hill. It's all about we're going down the hill real fast, and going, woo! But what really grabbed me is that, you know, it's a roller coaster ride and all that, but it draws you in. And it gets to a point where if you're used to reading comics or manga or books or anything, you feel like, all right, I know where this is going to go. I know what's going to happen. Like an event happens. And after that event, you think, all right, they're going to react to it in this way, but then no one's going to do anything. And then this is going to be remembered later. And then something, you know, and basically the characters aren't stupid and the situation progresses very rapidly and every character just immediately does if not what I would do, at least something that makes sense. Yeah. The situation progresses. The there way were humans... a few times where they had that symptom of, 
You know, like, oh, why don't you just do this? Oh, and it doesn't happen. And I'm a little upset, even though it might happen later or earlier. It just doesn't happen in, like, the exact way I want it to. You yeah, know? but at least part of that is that they are kids, and they really don't know what they're yes, doing. But it doesn't happen in a way that just makes me put the book down and say, fuck this shit. That's just stupid. But it's just... I expected a few tedious parts of the story to appear because they set themselves up like every other piece of media does where if this kind of thing happens, then there's this kind of scene or this series of scenes before it's resolved. And they basically skip right over that and cut to the chase. I think what it is also is that whenever a thing happens, instead of having the typical expected series of scenes to resolve it, it's just the worst possible consequence immediately pops out, yep. and then something else, and then then you have to resolve that with the worst possible consequence. I mean, it's one, one of those, after the other. It's kind of like how Rome fell, in that there was no one factor that made Rome fall. There's no one factor that made what happens in this comic happen. It's that all these little things and all these stupid accidents just kind of all happen at the wrong time, and as a result, the whole thing just gets out of control. Yeah, it's mostly a combination of, you know, certain people have certain feelings, and then certain opportunities arise, and everyone sort of acts in their own interest, and people are trying to control other people, and they can't, and, you know, people get pissed off, and then, ah, shit. Yep, because if, and if you look at it, the whole thing stems back from, like, one of the first scenes I mean, all this starts when the kids, they aren't even trying, they're not like they're trying to escape or anything. They just kind of go into the tunnel to hang out at night. And, and then things just go out of control from that. I keep saying out of control. Sort of like an Archduke Ferdinand. Yeah, except uh, the Prussians don't come and save the day in this one. No, no, they don't. I don't think save the day is the operative word for what the Prussians did either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, the art in the book, I mean, it's not like, it's not something you're going to sit in awe and look at like whoa look at that art no it's very functional art it yes. serves the purpose you get what's going on it doesn't stand out but it doesn't detract either yep i mean it's not like you know it's it's, all, it's not bad like i'm looking at it and i'm like oh that's terrible i can't even look at it yeah it, like the, but the characters get really off model a lot all the time yeah i do notice a few things though that like there's really good like coloring going on like yes. when they're out in the woods like you have all these bright colors and actually they'll draw the characters like with cleaner lines a lot more like uh, a newspaper comic strip and then like when things are all dark and in the tunnel they'll like sort of paint everyone with this really dark like washes and things and it, it definitely they they do things with the art to go with the mood and enhance the storytelling but it's not art that is so amazing and attractive to the eye that you want to put a poster on your wall because it's some amazing thing. Also, they do something interesting where there's a few there's a section in the middle where there's a bunch of flashbacks to the kids when they were younger kids before before they kind of realized what was going on. And it's basically Archie at that point. Yeah, yeah. It startled me for a second because when I first, whenever I read a comic, especially a one-off, I always kind of flip through it just to get a sense of it before I read it. So I flip through this and I open to a random page and I see all this Archie. And that really threw off my expectations for what this was about. <laughs> That'll super throw you off. Good God, it is not about that. No, it's not. But I mean, I guess it could be about that if Archie was actually a serial killer the whole time and he never realized it. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. That's... And that would make Archie awesome. It would. Think about that. Yeah. Uh, okay, anyway. But it, it does show you how they change the style of art to serve the story as opposed to serving awesome, amazing art or anything yeah. like that. Plus, the, the, when there's fire, the way they get the fire in there, the fire looks really cool, yes. I must say. The way it's painted in there. It's, and it's, I got to say, the art does do work very well at the end because there is a scene, like near the end, it's kind of like the end of Lord of the Flies. Or remember, actually, now that I think about Lord of the Flies did the same thing, where the story starts out very slow and methodical, and the pace of the bad things that are happening are just increasing and increasing and increasing, and brings you to this feverish pace. And then the end of Lord of the Flies is suddenly all the... I'm going to ruin Lord of the Flies. Oh, shit. <laughs> Statute of limitations, I think. All the kids spill out, and there's an adult standing there, because he's on the island. And suddenly, like, the camera's just zoomed in, and everything's going so fast, and suddenly the camera zooms out, and you're back in the real world, and you're back in normal time, and there's this moment of, wow, I came this far, this story came this far, and you finally get a moment of relief when things finally get resolved, and it's a very palpable moment of relief. Yeah, 
Yeah, another thing is I, I think uh, the story has, the way it's painted and stuff, the lighting is actually really cool. Like, it is, it is. It's, it, you know, the characters are drawn kind of, like, not the greatest designs in the universe. I mean, you can recognize which character is which, but there's not, like, super facial expressions going on or anything. But when there's lights and things, it's always, like, the, the contrast is like, ooh, look at that. You know, and you can tell, like, light shining through in caves and shining through windows and, and all different colors of light. It works pretty well. All right. Yep. Also, I'll just point out that I guess the moral or the lesson learned from this is pretty much right along my thinking. It was definitely a validation of things that I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Whatever this comic is trying to say, whatever you think whatever you think it's trying to say after you read it. I mean, I can tell you what I think it's trying to say. But... Well, as long as you don't think, yeah, those fucking kids, it's all their fault. Yeah, as long <laughs> as you don't think that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it uh, is definitely uh, agreeable. You know, and it's also because it's so agreeable. It's like the guy writing it knows what I think, and he thinks the same thing. So he purposely puts things in that, like, especially in the earlier parts, that like piss him off, and he knows they'll piss me off too. Yep, there's a lot of little bits, little nits where a character does or says something, and it just goes so against everything that I believe and everything that I am. And it's obvious that he's very deliberately vilifying the characters that he wants you to yeah. not like. He basically makes the people so... He vilifies them so perfectly that it's like an instant bad guy. Like, you'll read, like, a superhero comic, and they'll be, like, this evil-looking dark guy who's fighting the superhero. And you won't hate that guy even one thousandth as much as you hate some of the people in this thing. Yep. It's like, Magneto? Hey, you can be kind of cool, Magneto. Sure. I feel sorry Doctor for Doom? Magneto. Yeah, I like Magneto. Doctor Doom's the man. Yeah, but, the, like, the normal guy on the street in this is like, fuck you, asshole. God <laughs> damn that guy. I hope he dies right now. I hope he dies before he was even in the book at all. Yeah, I gotta say, there are some characters that when they get, if, if and when certain characters get what's coming to them, I actually stopped, and in a moment, I thought, it's about time. Damn straight. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. And it's only eight issues, so, you know, even though you might be suffering for, like, maybe 20 minutes, you'll read this whole thing in one shot, and you'll, you'll at the end, you won't be It's definitely uh, a roller coaster. It pulls you to the top, it throws you down, and then it's over, and you're walking back to the car. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, Elks Run by Joshua Hale Fialkov from Villard Books. $20, about. It is well worth purchasing. You can probably get it on Amazon. I highly recommend it. Yep. And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for our opening theme. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com. If you like our podcasts, you'll love our forums. Make sure you visit them. You can send your email feedback to geeknights at gmail.com. And if you want, you can leave us a voicemail at 206-333-1537. Geek Nights airs every weeknight, Monday through Thursday. Geek Nights is recorded with absolutely no studio and no audience. But unlike those other talk shows, it's actually recorded at night.